Very good. Let's do it. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome someone who I believe is the only person that I know of who has launched a book into space, which is pretty cool. His name is Professor Richard Wiseman. Now, for those of you that don't know who he is, he has been described by the Scientific American columnist as being one of the most interesting and innovative experimental psychologists in the world today, believe it or not, which I think is true because if you have a look at some of his work it is pretty incredible and very interesting his books have sold over three million copies and he regularly appears on the media doing talks and, and whatnot richard also presents keynotes talks to organizations across the world including the swiss economy economic forum sorry google and amazon he holds britain's only professorship and get this in the public understanding of psychology at the university of het hurt Ford Shire, if I got that right, I was practicing the other day, <laughs> is one of the most only followed psychologists on Twitter and the Independent on Sunday. I uh, chose him as being one of the top 100 people who make Britain a better place to live. Imagine having that on your resume. He's got an incredible YouTube channel, which you can go and check out called Quirkology. I've been uh, digesting a lot of the videos on there and they're quite fun. I'm learning a lot. And uh, Let's just say I'm hoping to put a lot of those things into practice myself, be uh, the, the life of the party, I guess you could say. Uh, but Professor Wiseman, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Thank you very much and a pleasure to be here. It's so good to have you on here. I mean, your bio can go even longer. I only read out a short version of it. You have these incredible books called The Luck Factor, 59 Seconds. Uh, there's another one which I mentioned that you actually launched into space, which is pretty cool. It's called Moonshot. What landing a man on the moon teaches us about collaboration, creativity, and the mindset for success. So having that, uh, I guess, uh, title, <laughs> my very first question for you is, what does success look like for you? That's a very good question. I, I think success is, I always say that if you've got a passion in life and you can find a way of making a living, uh, indulging yourself in that passion, then that's probably the recipe for a successful and happy life. And I've been very fortunate. So one of my sort of fascinations since I was a young kid was magic and, and uh, conjuring. And I've got to do lots of work on the psychology of illusion and magic. And whenever I do that, I bring quite a lot of passion and energy to it. And, and uh, you know, time flies when I'm indulged in, in that kind of research. So, yeah, I, I would say success is when you've got a passion, you've got something that, that really uh, consumes you. If you can find a way of making a living out of it, you're probably doing all right. Hmm. When was the moment for you that you realized that passion and doing the things that you love was in fact successful? Was it when you were a little kid or has it been this sort of gradual thing over the course of your life, getting lost in learning about things and, and just this understanding of it? Or is it, there was a catalyst moment somewhere in your life? You know, I, I haven't thought about it very much. I'm not someone that plans ahead very much. So if a project comes along, and I'm fortunate enough that the projects kind of come along all the time, or I try to initiate one, I just kind of think, is this interesting to me? Because if it is, I'll take a lot of energy to that. I'll probably spend a lot of time trying to do it as, as well as I can do it. And there's probably quite a few me's in the world. There's people that are interested in that particular thing. So I remember when we started the YouTube channel, I think it was in 2009, something like that, or maybe 2007, it's quite early adopters um, uh, of it. Yeah, we weren't doing it in order to, to become famous or to get millions of views or anything like that. I just enjoyed making these quirky illusion-based videos. And it's the same with all the books. You know, you have an idea and you think, well, that would be a fun thing to look at. So I'm not someone that that looks ahead and kind of goes, well, this, this is what success would look like. Or, um, you know, if, if I do this, I'll be happy. You know, I, I think it's very much in the process of it. It's in the doing of it um, rather than, than being sort of goal oriented. I, I'm very much, is this making me laugh and smile and bringing me into contact with other interesting people right now. Mm. Why are you passionate about magic specifically? I, I find it endlessly fascinating. Mm. And so magic has a enormous literature. I mean, you know, thousands and thousands of books and magazines and journals and so on. The community of magic is fascinating. It's a 
very strange bunch of people. They're quite <laughs> interesting to hang out with, to say the least. Um, it's something which is very creative because you have to think in a very lateral way. You know, I always say that when most people see a chair, if you can only see three legs, they assume there's a fourth leg there. Magicians don't. They go, hold on a second, I can only see three. What would happen if there wasn't a fourth? That's how they think all the time. That's that's why magic tricks work. And it brings you into contact with other people. If you've got a kind of trick, it's something you can do very quickly, pretty much for for, for anyone. So all these things make it, I think, quite a unique offering. Um, and you know, I, I never get bored. I always feel like a kid again when the magic magazine arrives every month and, and I look through it and, and, and look to see what other people are doing. So I, I find it very interesting. Do you have a famous uh, magician from the past? Oh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of anyone who, ma- <laughs> who makes a living doing magic. I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, so I think anyone that, that, um, can do that. I mean, when you go back to the very kind of famous magicians, Houdini always stands out in terms of a, a magician who's no longer with us um, as, as being this incredible uh, figure. And I think part of that is that the themes he was playing with, which was about escape, uh, about being, you know, he came from very humble beginnings and made himself this, this huge celebrity, about facing up to death and the finality of that, all these themes, I think, resonate with us even now. And that's why you still hear his name. So, you know, he's always one that comes up in in conversation. So when was the moment that, or more or less, why did you decide to go into psychology and and study psychology and not become a magician? Oh, so I'd gone to magic very young when I was about eight or nine thought that I would be a professional magician. I thought this would be the greatest way of earning a living ever. And then did that thing, which everyone should do, which is gave it a reality check. <laughs> and it it turns out, uh, or it turned out for me, uh, that actually is extremely hard way of earning a living. You're working quite antisocial hours and it's all a bit uncertain. And I I didn't really enjoy it very much. And by then, and this is me and my sort of mid to, to, to late teens, um, I'd become fascinated by the psychology of magic. You know, magicians need to really think about where people are looking, what they're going to remember. Uh, if you ask them to choose a card, where their hand's going to go and all of this sort of thing. And and the psychology started to take over and I decided to do a degree in psychology. And I, I did that in London and then my PhDs um, up in Edinburgh on the psychology of magic and, and deception. Yeah. And What's, I think what's interesting is if you've got two interests, and I've got magic and psychology, you know, I'm never going to be the world's greatest magician. I'm never going to be the world's greatest psychologist, but I've got a chance of being quite an interesting psychologist that has a background in magic, or indeed a magician that's got a background in psychology. So combining things like that, I think is quite an interesting formula. And that's certainly what, what I've done. Um, and psychology helps you with that because you can combine it with almost anything. You know, if you're into interior design, you can look at the psychology of it. If you're into podcasting, you can look at the psychology of it, whatever it is. So, so I got into it because of magic. Um, and it, it's and, and because so I, I conducted hundreds of psychology experiments and they have to work, if you like, for most people, but not everyone. What's interesting about magic and with their experiments, the experiments they're doing on stage every night, is they have to work with everyone under all circumstances. You can't have one or two members of the audience that figure out how the illusion's performed. Mm. And and so in that sense, they're very good psychologists. So I I find it an interesting um, combination. I love magic and I love psychology, even though I haven't studied. I love speaking to psychologists and professors, but I think the, the idea and the intersection of studying magic and psychology is even more fascinating because it appeals to my childhood even more so being able to watch a ton of magicians perform and and trick me <laughs> so to speak so i always wondered how they were able to do it and you know you, you told you know it's sleight of hand deception it's not really real or is it real like you you're confused to oblivion so i wanted to ask you going into the psychology of deception and really trying to hone in on what makes a good magic trick. Is it more or less the, the actual deception, the human being uh, deceiving people? Is that the whole gist of, of a magic trick? 
It's a very good question, and we could probably spend the rest of our lives talking about it. It's a very hotly debated <laughs> topic within magic. So there will be some magicians that will tell you it is about fooling people and that my job as a magician is to fool you. And that's what makes a good magic trick. And that's what, about what magicians refer to as method, mm. the secret bit that you're not, be able to, you're not supposed to be able to figure out. And that is obviously true to some degree. If you can figure out, it's not a great trick. I would argue that what's interesting as a social psychologist about magic is that I need to fool you, but you still need to like me. Because otherwise, I'm just annoying. I'm just that annoying person at the party that shows you a puzzle you can't figure out. And I don't want to be that annoying person at a party. So then the question is, how can I give you this experience of something impossible? And you still like me. And in fact, thank me for it at the end. And to me, if you can get that sorted, that's what makes a good magic trick. Mm. And, and that's very, very different. And you know, I, was, I was talking to a very well-known magician a few years ago, and they drew a distinction, I think is a helpful one for all of us, regardless whether you're into magic, between performing, which is for the good of your audience, and showing off, which is for your own ego. And it's a very helpful distinction. When we all post on social media, are you showing off or are you posting something to help or entertain the people that are looking at uh, 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 what they're looking at? And I think that's a very helpful distinction. Um, so, yeah, I, I think with magic, you're trying to craft this rather unusual experience of something impossible. Mm. And maybe you're getting people to reflect on something that you think is an important issue, or you're just taking them out of their everyday reality for a few moments. So they forget their problems. Or you're giving them a good time. You're trying to make them laugh or whatever it is. I'm not so quite so keen on here's a puzzle you can't solve and here's another puzzle you can't solve. Yeah. Is it becoming harder these days to, I guess, fool people and into believing magic tricks or is that always going to be, you know, easy to fool people, I guess? <laughs> uh, well, the distinction between fooling, I don't think that's changed at all. I mean, that... that you know, the, the bits of our psychology that magicians use are always going to be there. And I mean, so let me, let me go one step back. The reason why you're so amazing and all the people listening to this are so amazing is that you make assumptions all of the time. You see a chair, you don't check out, it's got that fourth leg. That's why humans are great. They make assumptions, which 99% of the time are correct. And it allows them to be very effective in the world. Magicians come along and exploit the 1% of time that, that you're, you're wrong, as it were. So if we're going to be continually continue to be successful, you're going to continue to make those assumptions and people like magicians are going to continue to be able to fool you. I think what, what does change is people's skepticism towards magic, whether they want to figure it out or not. And that's to do with the context of the trick. It's to do with the performer and, and, and then the culture and the time and so on. And sometimes what saddens me is when, when you get people that they're, they're, all they want to do is figure out the trick. They're not interested in thinking, my goodness, wouldn't it be wonderful if you really could make an object disappear? Or oh, that gave me a little thrill then. It's like being a kid again. Mm. Or actually that made me really curious and, and so on. It just comes down to, is it up your sleeve? So, so I think that's what changes is people's reaction, but they're going to get fooled by the trick. These things have worked for hundreds of years. They're going to continue to work for hundreds of years. I mean, I think growing up, I didn't really care much about trying to figure out how it worked, but I've always been a curious minded kid. And I guess later on I've gone, well, wouldn't it be great if I could actually do that? So in order for me to actually do it, I need to be able to figure out how they did it in the first place. Yeah. But then I just realized, hey, there's no point. I'm never going to be able to do it. I'm not good at it. I'd just rather interview people that know how to do it <laughs> and get to that sort of logic side of things. But um, the, I, the, the start of magic uh, the, or the history of magic has always really fascinated me as well. Um, do you know, or you were a part of David Copperfield's, I believe, History of Magic, his book on, on that. 
Um, where did magic really begin? What are the roots of magic? Yeah, we, we don't know is the answer. I mean, whenever there's people around, uh, there's probably going to be magic because I, I think we like, I think we have this ability to simulate alternative worlds, to think about, well, what could be? So we do it all the time. You think, well, what will happen if I say this to that person? What will happen if I take this job offer rather than that one? We simulate these worlds that don't exist. I'm not certain that other animals do that. You know, I, I, I don't think a Labrador dog kind of, kind of goes, well, what will happen if I don't eat that biscuit? You know, they, they just eat the biscuit, quite frankly, uh, in my experience of Labrador dogs. So what we do is simulate these things. And I think that we have the ability to simulate impossible things, you know, and and, and so magic is about thinking of another world where the, the um, constraints of this world don't apply. What would it be like if an object really could disappear or I really could um, get access to your thoughts? And I think what's, what's marvelous about that is once in a while, we simulate something or we think of something that sounds impossible and then we figure out a way of doing it. And it's the link between my magic work and the moon book. So the idea in the late 60s of putting a person on the moon and bringing them back to Earth, crazy, crazy ambitious, almost impossible. But we could think about that. We could think about how amazing it would be if we could do it. And then they thought of a way of making it happen. And I think that is what underpins our belief and our experience of magic, being able to simulate impossible events, because once in a while, we then figure out a way of actually making that happen. So it's the price you pay for being so wonderful once in a while. Mm. Have you got any burning questions that you're still trying to find the answers to regarding the psychology of magic? Um, I mean, they're burning questions. I mean, I, I think trying to understand why you know magic exists pretty much in every culture throughout the whole of recorded history, there has to be something there. And when you watch, you know, kids uh, play very early on, they're doing impossible play. They're, you know, superheroes or objects are disappearing and appearing. There's something very fundamental about this. And I don't think we've really cracked quite what that is. And it's that aspect of magic that I, I guess I find most interesting. I think there's something a bit like sleep or um, dreaming or something. It's in our DNA. It feels like it's there. And, and we don't fully understand or appreciate quite why. The creativity aspect of magic, obviously, per magician, they come up with some crazy, outrageous tricks to perform. Is Where does that actually, the idea of being creative, what does that actually mean first and foremost? And secondly, how does that really help the person play into being, I guess, more creative with when it comes to uh forging up new tricks all the time like does it ever stop no it doesn't i mean it, it is in incredible i find it amazing so you might have an effect which is what magicians kind of call tricks it's a slightly different word um and that might be an effect that was created let's suppose 1900 mm. and since 1900 120 years the brightest, best magicians have been working on different ways, levitating a person, let's suppose, different ways of doing that. Still, someone tomorrow will come up with something that no one's ever thought of in 120 years. It's phenomenal. Mm. Um, and it happened just last week. You know, it's a well-known card trick that has a particular plot to it. I came up with a new method. I shared it with a magician friend of mine. It turns out they've been working on a new way of doing it. They shared it with their friend. So that's the third person. All of us have now got different ways of doing this. And that plot's been around for at least 50 years. So there's a lot of room uh, for, for creativity. I also think it's a phenomenal mindset. So if you had a bunch of magicians and you said, look, you have to make an omelette, my guess is most of us wouldn't know even what goes in an omelet. We're not practical people in that in that sense. I don't know. Very few magicians have ever cracked an egg uh, and made anything uh, out of it. They made the egg vanish, but that's a different thing. However, if you say to them, "You need to make this coffee cup disappear," 
most people would go, don't be, it's a, it's a solid coffee. Go, gosh, you can't make it this bit. Magicians will come up with 10 methods. We are so used to taking something that seems impossible and making it happen. And that's why I think for kids, it's a really unique mindset of don't, don't sort of just dismiss things out of hand. Think about, no, could I do it? And how would I do it? And there's, as a magician, you always know there's another way. There's always another way if you just think about it enough. And I think that's a great life lesson. You know, that idea of there's, there's nothing so dangerous as a person with a single thought or a single way of doing something. There's always another way. You just have to find it. And I, so I, I think magic is you know, intensely creative. I like that life lesson. I kind of, yeah, I kind of relate to it quite a bit. <laughs> just like persistently working towards finding an, another way. If you get blocked, then I, I either say you can go around it, you can push your way through it, you can go over it, or yeah, whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. But there's always- I, did, I mean, I, I'm involved in lots of creative enterprises and just magic. I've done lots with the ad industry and so on. The worst creativity meetings. In fact, I always think you might as well go home if anyone ever says it, is we've got unlimited budget. We can do anything at all. Yeah, It will never lead to anything. The best ones are, you know what? We've got half the budget you need. We've only got some spaghetti and some marshmallows to, to make this particular thing or whatever it is. It's restrictions that make us creative. Um, so when you put on a magic show, you know, if you're doing a show yourself, you haven't got millions of pounds to spend on it. You instantly you're restricting yourself. That's what makes you creative. So that's one thing. And the other thing in terms of creativity, I always say is just find out what everyone else is doing and do the opposite. That's an interesting thought that I want to kind of understand more about. Like, why is it that when we do place restrictions on a person that we become somehow more creative? Why is that? Is it because we're designed that way? Creativity is in, is ingrained <sighs> like that? I think it, I, it's a very good question. I've already thought about why. I've just seen it happen so many times. Mm. I would say because it restricts your problem space. So if you say, um, you know, we're going to, I'm just use a magic example. We're going to put somebody into a box and then they need to disappear. Yeah. Unlimited budget. Wow, my goodness. Well, you can, there's 20 ways you could do it. They're all cost you a fortune. As soon as you say to me, it's a cardboard box, that takes out half of them. As soon as you say, we're not on a stage with a trap door, that takes out a few more. And now I'm, you've got me interested because now I've got a really concrete problem to solve. I've only got a few pounds and I can't use a trap door. Now I'm thinking. And so I think it restricts the problem space in a kind of interesting way. You look at those Quackology videos. Mm. We never spent, I don't think, more than 30 pounds on any video at all. It was always our, our thing, but it was just bulls or cutlery or whatever it was, corks that around the house. Mm. And so we never had that mindset of, we're going to spend a thousand pounds on a video. It was like, well, don't be daft, we haven't got that kind of money. We're just going to spend where we've got. And it restricts you. And I think they're, they're rather lovely for it. They're kind of homely and creative and, and, and also quite inspirational because you go, is, is an ordinary object doing something extraordinary? So I, I'm always a big fan of restriction rather than expansion. The expansion side of things, it would seem a little bit easy for people. But then when you really look at it from a bigger point of view, it kind of feels a bit impossible because you kind of like, I've got too much available to me I'm yeah. not really using my brain, so to speak. I'm not really thinking too much. It's yeah, just- I think it, the problem space becomes just too big. Yeah. And, and so really when you want to drill down in, into a much smaller, more interesting space. Mm. Um, and, and that's when, yeah, that's when interesting stuff happens, I think. Is that the same for when you have more than one person on a project that when you restrict everyone, then bigger results happen? Or is it just for one person in particular with one job? It's everywhere, isn't it? Mm. Um, I've worked with a lot of teams. I'm trying to think of creativity stuff with teams. I think what what I've seen with teams sometimes is 
people get into a certain mindset about the sorts of problems they're trying to solve or the sorts of solutions. And sometimes somebody will make an offhand comment, a silly comment. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but wouldn't it be funny if we film the whole thing upside down or whatever it is? Unless you've got an ear for that, the group pass it by. And actually what you should do is stop and go, let's explore that a bit more. The thing that seems a bit crazy off the wall, it's not what we're looking for. That's where the answer is. And, mm -hmm. and it's an odd if you don't get it, if, if in terms of creativity meetings, in my opinion, if you don't get it in 30 minutes, you won't get it in 30 days. You, you can't work away at it. It will either come or it won't. And it comes from a silliness. It comes from a, a flexible place. And you're listening out for that one person that says, wouldn't it, you know, God, what we should do is forget the whole thing and just get everyone to go naked. Uh, and, and, and then you go, actually, that's quite a good idea. That would solve the problem. In a and, and I've been in so many groups where unless you've got your ear out, you, you, you go straight past those solutions. It's, it's a very odd thing. Why is collaboration important for, I guess, completing projects, success, the whole, whole bit? We don't you know, have to, to collaborate. I think everyone brings their expertise and, and, and chatting about things and kicking things around and not solidifying too early. You know, it's, it's easy to, I think uncertainty makes us feel anxious and a bit worried. And if you're going to live in a creative world, you've got to live with it. You've got to live with not knowing. But then once you do know, you have to move ahead quite quickly. Otherwise, you're not going to produce anything. But that initial stage of, oh, let's try it this way. Let's try it that way. I think people close down too, too quickly with a lot of uh, projects. It's always been my experience where you think, oh, so I haven't heard it yet. I haven't, we'll know it when we hear it. We'll know it when we hear it. Let's just meet up again, you know, and we'll go for a walk. Walking seems to help. Traveling seems to help. Um, talking to different people about it. Uh, all these, all these things. Um, I used to, when generating ideas for books, I would always go to parties and tell people what the idea for the book was. And because then you've got a real whites to the eyes thing. Because otherwise you build castles in your head. You think, God, it's an amazing book. If it was, you know, pretend interviews with the world's greatest psychologists from the past, this is great. And then you go to a party, you mention it to people that might buy that book and no one's interested. They just skate straight past it on the conversation. You know, that was a terrible idea. So unless it, provokes some interest from people or curiosity or causes best of all a big argument in the room that's always a good one uh then you haven't got anything so you, you've got to you've got to test your ideas as well and it all it all takes time it all takes time i i kind of do that as well like if i have a crazy wild book idea or something like that i'll go to someone some of my friends and let them know about it and see their reaction if they like it then I kind of think, well, maybe I'm onto something here. If they don't like it, well, then I might have to adjust. Or maybe my pride gets in the way and says, no, I like it, so I'm going to do it anyway and see how we go. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I completely understand that that line of thought. Um, I wanted to ask you about, this is probably a, a crazy question. It's just probably my curiosity playing the best of me here, but it might be hard to answer. We'll see how we go. But what is the most creative thing you've ever done? Oh, I've no idea. I, um, I don't know. Quacology is quite an interesting idea. The idea of taking everyday objects and doing something unusual with them and creating little illusions. Most of them filmed in this room, actually. Fifty nine seconds um, came about because I went for a cup of coffee with a friend of mine, who's CEO of a big company. They weren't very happy. And they said, well, you know the secrets of happiness. I've done some research on happiness. What would make me happier? I started to explain. They looked at their watch and said, can you get on with it? Mm -hmm. I said, how long have you got? They said, about a minute. And I, I get, so that's a good example of we could have skated straight after that, over that. Mm -hmm. I walked away. And I thought, you know what? Maybe people want to learn things in less than a minute. So how much psychology could you learn? I thought it's quite a lot of it, actually. And now suddenly, less than a minute, 59 seconds, nice little curious title. And that became quite a big book. And then this idea of quick learning stuff, which is now sort of everywhere, but that was one of the books that started it off. 
And that's what I mean. It's not skating past. It's stopping and going, that was sort of said a bit as a joke. There's something in that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that always felt quite a creative thing. Uh, so I, I would say those. Um, i trying to think there's other um, stuff. I mean, I mean, launching a book into space. That's great. Yeah, it wasn't my idea. Uh, that was somebody else's idea, actually. So um, a friend of mine, Helen Keane, who works uh, on sort of comedy and space stuff, that was her idea. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the ultimate book launch was 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 very nice. Um, so I, I think, I mean, some of the magic I've created is is quite unusual. So uh, I, I'm, I live in Edinburgh. We have this huge arts festival every year. And there are thousands of shows. I used to sit on the board of the Edinburgh Festival. So thousands of shows come into town. I sat down one day. I said, what is, it was my do the opposite rule. What do all these shows have in common? And the only thing I could think of was they all involve performers on stage. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to do a show with no performer. Now, that's kind of interesting. Now you think, what does that even mean? How would you control an audience? What experience they're going to have? And so we decided to run a whole load of psychology experiments on the audience, essentially using PowerPoint. So they came in, they sat down instantly, which half of the room that sat in told you something about them. So on. it's called experimental. I think that's quite creative. And it's a good example of the do the opposite rule. And again, to put on that show, of course, you could put it on in a huge theater and spend millions of pounds and have it make. We didn't have that. You know, you know, we had a budget of a thousand pounds or something. So, what do you do for that? It constrains you, and you start to think about all the little things you can do and all the fun things. Um, so, yeah, so that that show started with a buzzer on stage, and the, there's you know the audience were in an auditorium. The stage is you know four foot high stage, and it simply came up on the screen to start the show. Somebody needs to come up on stage and hit the buzzer. And you can see all these people kind of go, I'm not going. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> not with, oh, you go up. No, I'm not going up. And we just left it. We just left it there until somebody's brave enough to go on stage. As soon as they went on stage, always a huge cheer. And they hit the buzzer. And it just closed the whole show to nothing. We went to total black because that wasn't the buzzer we were talking about. There's a much smaller buzzer over the other side that no one had noticed. And eventually someone would shout out, it's the smaller buzzer. And they'd go over and hit it. And that started the show. So that that was just it all came from what would happen if you took the performer out. So that was, that was quite a creative thing. That is brilliant. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> I would have loved to be part of that audience. That would have been super fun. Yeah. It was, it was what's well, funny because you realize what performers do. Because if, if member audience members started to mess around, there was no one on stage to kind of go, oh, don't, don't do that. But the audiences took responsibility for the show. They, yeah. they sorted themselves out because they knew there was no one, to, no one else to sort them out. So it was, the dynamic was really interesting. That is so cool. But it kind of, it, it leads me into the idea of your, you know, your YouTube videos of Quirkology, but you've also got a book called Quirky Psychology. Mm. Um, but one of the things you do talk about, you know, you are, you, kind of mentioned in the book um, what a person's walk reveals about their personality and, and those sorts of things. But what does a person's ambition ambitions in life reveal about their personality? Yeah, I don't know. Um, what about their, their ambitions? Uh, I suppose when you ask people what they want to do, some people are going to go very materialistic. Mm-hmm. And say, I want to be a millionaire or whatever. Never a great answer, in my opinion. Some people say, I want to be a celebrity, which I have slightly above the millionaire as a terrible answer. Then other people go, I just, I just want to do something interesting. Um, other people say, I want to help others. You know, I want to make a meaningful contribution. And I think all those, so I suppose that tells you something. What I'd be more interested in is what happens 10 years later to those different groups of folks. Do they really hold on to that? Or do they realize that, you know, being famous is a, I I know quite a few famous people reasonably well. And, and, you know, it's, again, 
it's difficult. They they can't walk down the street like you and I can, and 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 so on. So yeah, I suppose that tells you something uh, a little bit about them. Um, I would always come back to passion. You know, it was always the passion test which I put into um, uh, Moonshot, which was that imagine you're stranded on a desert island, you're allowed one stack of books about one topic. What's that topic? Because that's your passion. Now just figure out how you make a living from that. It's a very simple thing, but it just again focuses the mind. Um, and so I use that a lot. I like that question. I'm it's very simple. And, and, it, and it also tells you a lot, you know, that so celebrity is a bit of a vacuous concept and being rich. It doesn't tell you how you're going to get there. But what that tells you is it gives you a little signpost as, as mm-hmm. to, well, if you follow that, you're probably going to be more passionate. You're probably going to put more time in than most people. Maybe that's going to get you where you want rather than having this goal, which is just out of focus, you know, being famous or being rich. How does a person's name influence their life as well? Like this is something that I'm very interested in. <laughs> uh, that was in quickology as, as well, uh, in all sorts of ways. So there's an idea that, that um, so my surname is Wiseman, which is always is a genuine surname. It's always been quite helpful as an academic because uh, it sort of sounds like the sort of thing it should be. <laughs> um, so there's, there's that sort of thing. It's how memorable your name is. You want something which is in the sweet spot of not being extre- extremely common, but also not being so sort of rare, as it were, that, that no one can remember it. There's also, I mean, I'm a wise man obviously begins with W, which means whenever there's a list, I'm very used to being at the bottom of that, that list. <laughs> which I don't think they do it at schools now, but in, when I was at school, they'd call out the names in alphabetical order. And so I was always at the bottom of everything uh, and just a queuing up or, or whatever. So, yeah, it's probably better to be a little bit higher up. Um, so, yeah, there's various ways in which your, your name influences uh, your life. But people shouldn't be too worried about it. Pretty small effects in the, the, the bigger scheme of things. I've had a lot of people say how much they love my last name, Phantom. They're like, that is such a cool last name. I'm like, yeah, I'm quite proud of it too. <laughs> it's great. It's pretty good. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool last name and it kind of like, uh, there's movies, but they spell it wrong. They put PH in front of it, but I won't, right. I won't judge them for that. The fan, with the F at the yes. beginning is the right way to do it. <laughs> uh, how does it influence your life? It, it, it sort of provokes curiosity, does it? It does. Like they asked me, where is it from? First, that's the first, usually the first question. And the second question yeah. is, um, like, why are you pretty much the only ones? I've never heard anyone with that last yeah. name before. Like there's not many people out there. I'm like, I know, I guess I'm unique in many more ways than one. So I guess that helps to inform my personality as well. Uh, and it makes me a little bit more memorable. I mean, like who can't yeah. forget Phantom? We, we just also have these running jokes in the fa- in the family, um, like to, towards being lucky as well. Like if we're, we're not very lucky one bit, but if we do get lucky, then we're like, Oh, it must be the curse of the Phantom Phantom name. <laughs> <laughs> so we just, yeah, we just like have fun with, with the last name a little bit. And then mum actually, when she was pregnant, she'd have people come up to her and ask her, uh, is she having a phantom baby? Like that sort of thing. <laughs> so we've it's had great. a lot of fun with it. And also, I mean, it's, it's a positive word in that, in that sense, you know, the, the thing. but also what you said there was really interesting. We have fun with it. Mm. And, and, and so it's going to be a bonding experience. Maybe for the people you meet, you tell them some of those stories and, and so on. You know, we forget how important that sense of community and 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 just, uh, you know, people being around us, huge buffer in terms of social stress because they help us and also in terms of opportunities. So building up those networks important and that kind of thing, you know, a party, that's that's an easy opening uh, and, 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 and so on. So, yeah, great. Fantastic. It really is. Whenever they see my name on the list, they're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yes. I want to go up to him and ask him a bunch of questions. But people just can't believe that I have that last name, which, you know, I kind of, you know, get a bit proud of. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, um, I've got a few more questions for you, Professor, if that's all right with you. Um, Really, really enjoy this wide ranging conversation. But the, you have this other book called uh, The Luck Factor. Uh, Does luck really exist or is it something that we've made up? Uh, Kind of both in a sense. So that, that came about, um, 
So again, I returned to my doing the opposite of everyone else. That that that's a that was my first book uh, about two thousand. I did that. At the time, people were looking at luck, and they were saying, "Look, it's either superstitious nonsense or it's just chance." And I was thinking, "Well, hold on a minute, maybe there's something to it." But I didn't want to go down the paranormal route. I'm quite skeptical about that. I thought, well, surely the idea of people making their own luck by the way they think and behave, that's not that radical. But no one was looking at it at that point in, in psychology. And so that's what I did. We, we um, collected a thousand exceptionally lucky and unlucky people. And we did lots of experiments with them. And what we saw was that the, A, the lucky people were more successful in their lives, pretty much wherever you measured it, in terms of health or financial income or family or longevity or whatever um, than the unlucky people. And second, they were thinking of behaving in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So in a very real way, it's true. In another way, there's nothing supernatural going on. In that sense, it's not a genuine phenomena. But yes, the way in which you think about yourself and others. And you can see it because you know, if you think someone's unlucky, well, you know, you probably don't want them as part of your team. Uh, if, if if you think someone's lucky, that's something you want to bring in, uh, and and so yes, it has a very real impact on people's lives. I was curious about are magicians just really lucky, or are they just incredibly intelligent <laughs> as well, and I, being I think, extremely quirky? I think neither. Uh, I think neither. I, I, I think they are very creative. They've got a very particular way of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, they, they tend to be a bit like comedians, actually. They tend to be on the brighter end of, of things. It's harder to, it's hard to do this stuff without being reasonably bright, whatever that means. Um, but I'm not saying they're, they're particularly lucky. They're lucky in the sense normally. I mean, it's really weird about magic. Most of us got into it age eight or nine. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, some of my closest friends are magicians. I've known them that long. And so they're properly close friends. It has a very, very close community. In that sense, they're lucky. Community matters. Yeah. Is there anything that you're currently excited about that you're researching at the moment that piques your passions and your interest? Well, right now we're looking at what happens when you teach uh, magic tricks to kids. So, oh. so passing on those soft skills of you know interaction and empathy and practice um, and what – it's, it's very strange when magicians make mistakes, other magicians love it because it's like a little learning experience. Mm. Yet in schools, when people make mistakes, they're punished for it. And that's a bad thing. And flipping that on its head and just going, you know what, that mistake might be the best thing that ever happened to you because it's now a different way of doing it. I think it's a very useful mindset. So we're looking at that and a few, a few other uh, sort of secret projects as well. Do you ever get sick and tired of teaching this, studying it at all? Not really, because it's always different. You know, the, the, the book you kindly mentioned with David Copperfield, uh, he's got this huge secret museum of, uh, of of magic and got to spend three years writing that book on the history of magic, going into that 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 museum. Uh, so, yes, it's the gift that keeps on giving. But there's, there's nothing special about magic. I mean, friends of mine are into dance and they're just as passionate about dance. Um, and, and so it's the same thing there. I do think, I always say this to, to students, um, you know, what, 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 find out what, what that fire is because it's going to keep you warm inside when it starts snowing outside. And, and it's very important to keep that fire burning, whatever it is, in, in terms of the, the passion uh, that, that you feel about certain things. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Professor Wiseman, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. I've got one final question for you, but before I ask it, where do you want people to connect with you, learn more about your work? I mean, you're not very hard to find at all online. <laughs> where do you want people to go the most? Uh, it's very kind. Uh, RichardWiseman.com will tell you about the research side of things. Uh, on YouTube, uh, Quacology, um, or In 59 Seconds, my two channels, and at Richard Wiseman on Twitter. Amazing. I'll make sure everyone knows where to go. Uh, but this is my all-time favorite question. I love asking all my guests at the very end. It is a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to get to the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you. Maybe it's a magic trick <laughs> and how they got it all, but we'll just call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? And this is other people in the film talking about me, is it? Is that, that the, 
they've been able to they've been able to get everything you've ever said and done, put it together in a film, and then show it to you on your hundredth birthday. I you're not going to like this. I don't want that film. I I want the hundred people. I I want the people to be around me. Mm. I don't want that film. Once you've done something, it's out there. You can't do anything about it, better or worse. It's done. If it makes people happy, that's great. If it makes them sad, I'm sorry about that. Um, I tried my best, but it's all behind you. What I would like instead are those friends I built up over a hundred years to be in the room with me. And we're not going to watch a film. We're just going to sit and laugh and chat. That's what I want that celebration to be. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to sidestep your question because I don't want that film. I don't, you know, once the books are done, I never open them again. The Quakology videos, I don't watch. Mm. I, it, it's done. I want to move on. So even at 100, I'd love me to be working on two or three projects uh, that are probably most of which are going to be terrible, but one might be great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to circumvent your question slightly and, and say, I don't want to film. I, I want, I want those folks around me. I like that because you're the first person that has ever done that. <laughs> no. on the show that I've asked a question to, but I think it is very interesting at the, at the same time, because, you know, it kind of goes back to a little bit of that experiment you did with no performer. <laughs> and and you just having people there to connect with and just be around you and have a good time i think that's that's yeah. important that's part of life but professor wiseman can i just say thank you so much for for your time today your wisdom your advice and have, making this such a fun conversation i know it was wide ranging but thank you so much for joining me today on the storybox podcast a uh, pleasure thank you very much and thank you for making it so much fun